Are you ready for God's word today? Amen. Amen. Okay, I have a message on my heart that uh, I believe is super important for this church. I mean, the most important message that I've preached here yet. Okay? The most important message. And I want to entitle it Fire. Okay? Let's pray. Let's pray the Holy Spirit will be the illuminating presence for us to understand His Word. Dear God, we thank You for the Bible. We thank You that we can open the Bible and hear the very words of God spoken through individuals under Your anointing. And we pray, Lord, because Your Word is active and alive, that You would speak to us in this moment where we find ourselves, Lord, in our life, in our circumstances, we need you today. And so we open up our hearts to your word and we pray, Lord, speak and help us to obey. In the name of Jesus, can you say amen? Amen. 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 I saw something really bizarre this week uh, in an article that I was reading. And it has to do with a guy playing golf. Now picture this. It's 2010. He's in California. Things are really dry in California right now. Well, anyway, he's out on the golf course. He has his iron, you know, his club. And he swings at the ball and kind of misses. And his club hits a rock. And a spark comes from the club hitting the rock. And all of a sudden, He's in the midst of a little fire. He can't put it out, and it grows and it grows until 25 acres are burned up. 150 firefighters have to come in, just helicopters. I mean, from a little spark, all that chaos. Fire. Now, we are able to see each other right now because of fire. You understand that, right? What's the sun? A big ball of fire. fire okay, you guys took science. Okay? <laughs> I can tell. And going through these lights, the electricity causes what? It's actually fire under control, right? We have heat in our building because there is gas that has been ignited that fires up and heats the water which runs through the pipes which comes out with air, right? So we're here and we're able to function in life because of fire. So fire is good, right? Fire is good, okay? But that same fire, out of control, becomes destruction. My home state of Maine, I was just reading an article in the paper yesterday, uh, a fire that killed uh, several people in Portland, Maine. So fire, that capacity to bless and give life, has also the same capacity to destroy and take away. We're going to talk about something today that the Bible compares to fire. And James gives us the wisdom. James chapter number 3, beginning with verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Can you say amen at the reading of God's Word? Amen. Okay, you've had this experience. It's a quiet time. You have time to think. Your mind goes back. And you think about different people. And you think about different conversations. And then you start to wince a little bit. Because in one of those conversations you had with someone, you said some words that you wish you hadn't said. And you go, oh, I wish I could have handled that. Everyone who's alive and who speaks knows that feeling. That's why we're going to talk today about the power of the tongue. Control the sparks. Words are like sparks. Control the sparks. So how do we do this? What does God's Word teach us about the tongue and our words. What are we to do? How do we control this fire? This possibility of great service to others or great destruction. How do we control it? Verses 1 through 3 in this section of James chapter 3 talks about the importance of paying attention to the words that we use. Okay? Considering what we say, we have to be very careful that we don't pretend that we know more than we know. That's why James begins this topic in chapter 3. He begins by saying, don't presume to be teachers, because teachers are going to be more strictly judged. So don't pretend to be an expert on something. I remember visiting in prison uh, and preaching. I, I did prison ministry for many years and preaching to the guys. And one guy came up to me after the service uh, and was sharing with me. And he was really trying to egg me on into an argument. I just kind of smiled at him. And I, you know, I wasn't going to get pulled into his little storm. And, but his whole thing was that he felt he knew so much about the Bible and about the certain doctrine having to do with the end times. And he thought that I was so, you know, I was wrong and I needed to be taught because he was so wise and so intelligent. After all, he had been a Christian for at least six months. And he had listened, he said, the reason why he knew so much is because he listened to preachers on the radio. And uh, I'm just looking at him and hearing him talk. And, you know, he's really trying to get an argument with me. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I, I'm not trying to think proud, but here, I'm thinking, okay, I, I pastored for about 25 years. Uh, you know, I've studied about seven years in, in schools to learn more about the Bible, and I've made all these teachings and sermons, and, and I love God, and here this guy is six months old in Christ, and he's like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and tell the pastor everything that he's wrong in. It's like, 
wow, that's like, this guy lacks no confidence, does he? You know? And so I just got thinking about that, how that we can think that we know so much and use that little three ounce muscle that's called the tongue, we can use it to be very boastful. You know, his thing was, I want to box with you, you know, with words. I want to argue with you. It's okay, go play. So, we have to be careful of the words that we say. The Bible says that not to presume to be teachers. There was a couple in our church uh, that I pastored where uh, they were having some marital problems and had temporarily separated. And a lady who was not from our church, I don't even know, I didn't even know who she was, but she kind of came in from the outside and she started to take over. And she was saying to the, the wife, you know, leave this guy. Or stay away from him for a long time. She was kind of got the ear of this, uh, this, this wife from our church. And as I heard her and saw her actions, I said, wait a minute. She's trying to be a marriage expert. I know how to figure out your marriage. Yet she was going against the very scriptures that talk about the importance of working things out together. And so she could have, and I'm thankful that this couple didn't really listen to her that much, but she could have just destroyed that marriage because she pretended to be this you know, great counselor, teacher. So again, we have to be very careful because God's going to hold us accountable Especially if we pretend that we're these experts and know so much. Pay attention to our words. Now, this is another way of saying exercise self-control. There's a great challenge in the Bible. Okay, you have to get this. This is like the great challenge of our time. If anyone, what a challenge, is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man. That word also means mature. He's a perfect man able to keep his whole body in check. So what are the evidences of you being in control of your life? Is you being in control of your tongue. If you say that, you know, that God is in control and yet you have a tongue that is wild, then you really are not letting God control you. So that's a test. The words that you say. All right, let's go on. If we're going to control the fire, okay, recognizing the power of our words has to take place. Verses 3 through 8 of the scriptures. Words change lives. I love you. I appreciate you. You know, I'm so thankful for your life. Thankful for what you do. You know, we could not accomplish this without you. I see a great future ahead for you. God is working in you. I can see Jesus shining through you. I hate you. You're, you're, you're pretty disgusting. I wish you were never born. There's nothing there anymore. I'm divorcing you. I wish you'd just shut up for good. In fact, I'm never going to talk to you again. I wish you'd just die. Power of words. Words change lives. You know, as I'm saying these words, you know words you've heard that have deeply affected your life. And if you've been hurt, as we all have, 
then be careful because hurt people tend to hurt people. So be really careful. Let Jesus heal you. The Bible gives us a, a little picture of the power of our words. A bit in a horse's mouth, if, you, if you've ever ridden a horse, that controls a horse. You pull on those reins and the horse slows down. You pull on the right and the horse goes to the right. That little five pound uh, bit in the horse's mouth controls that thousand pound animal. And the Bible goes on to describe a ship, this huge thing that you don't see underneath the surface, this tiny thing compared to the ship, this rudder that gives the direction of that huge boat. Words can destroy lives. That's why James is so dead serious he writes this. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. And so, your tongue can be an actual tool of the devil. And hell itself can inflame your tongue to spit out the poison that is almost demonic. So we have to decide, you know, what are we doing? What, how are we using our mouth? Is our mouth really a ministry? Or is it just for us to throw around words whatever mood we find ourselves in? Think before you speak. This is an awesome little acrostic. I, I like it a lot. Is it T, true? H, is it helpful? I, is it inspiring? N, is it necessary? K, is it kind? What is gossip? Gossip is telling information about someone else with the intention to hurt them, their character, uh, their life. You could be telling something that's true, but in your heart it's with an intention to hurt them. <clears throat> words. Your words are like fire. Let God do a work. Okay? Let God do a work by cleansing your words. Now, how does this happen? Is it just a matter of, you know, being clever? To get better at this, do we just need to learn techniques of how to speak or take a speech class or learn how to, some psychology so we can manipulate people by our words? Is that what it is? Is that what the Bible teaches us, controlling our words? No. In order to control our words, God has to control our hearts. Because it's not just trying to speak accurately, it's having the right words on the inside. Because if we're thinking right words, then we're going to overflow with right words. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, Jesus said this. He said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's, it's what's in our heart that's going to come out. I can pretend all I want to, all day long, and I can pretend, you know, that I'm one way, but if I'm saying different words in my heart, then for sure that's going to be found out, because the mouth speaks of the overflow of the heart. That's why I don't have to stand up in front of you 
and like be really worried if I'm going to accidentally swear. It's like, whoa, what? wouldn't that be a shock? It's like, if I just accidentally said a really bad word, like, that'd be kind of stupid. But I don't have to even worry about that because I'm not saying that in my heart. But if I'm saying it in my heart, and I'm going to try to repress it, hoping it doesn't pop out at the sermon. <laughs> right? But if you've, got it kind of, if you've got it controlled in your heart, then you don't have to worry because the overflow will not be personal or swear. I find in life, when I say stupid things, it's because I'm thinking stupid things in my heart. If I would just, Lord, how many think your thoughts? I mean, you can have fun. We can be humorous. That's not, I'm not saying don't be humorous, but... Stupid heart, stupid mouth. Well, that's really... What's the word for it? Profound? Stupid heart, stupid mouth. So let's be cleansed of cursing. Here's what James says. James says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. So we come to church and we lift up our hands Thank you, Jesus. You're so good and wonderful. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. And then Sunday afternoon, about three o'clock, someone really ticks us off. <laughs> Go to hell. Whoa! Praising God and then telling people someone to go to hell. Yeah, that really fits well, doesn't it? Or, Lord, we bless you. What a damn idiot! Right? Come on, let's be real. James says, you know, we're praising God with our tongue, and yet we're cursing the very people that God made. He said, well, that not ought to be. In other words, that should not be you. Okay? If you do, then you're a schizophrenic Christian. And so the way to overcome that is when we start getting angry at someone and we feel like cursing them, then we just be honest with God. God, that person's acting like an idiot. They're really off the wall. But help me to be in control. Because somebody's got to be the grown-up here. I hope it's me. You've got a house full of just kids including the big kids, and they're all just kids, and it's going to be a problem. Somebody's going to be the grown-up. Somebody's going to be in control of the words. What if we did this? What if we bugged your house, and for a week, everything that you said would be up on the screen next Sunday? Would you come to church? Would you? Or would you be happen to be visiting another country that Sunday? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's like everything that we say, we're going to be accountable before God. Now, I'm grateful there's forgiveness with God, aren't you? Yes, yes. I have to admit, I'm not perfect in this. I've said some really stupid things. I said, God, forgive me. Really help me. But just because God's forgiven me doesn't mean that I want to keep on saying stupid things over and over again. No, God forgive me, but teach me how to have my heart right with you. Amen. So I don't get controlled by a spirit of stupid. Amen. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. How about you? Amen. Anybody can be controlled by a spirit of stupid. I mean, that's, just, that's out there. That's, you know, all kinds of people. But being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So let's ask God, cleanse me, God, of hypocrisy. I don't want to be one way when I'm in church and a totally different way when I'm at home. Right? That's one of the reasons why sometimes preachers' kids can be the worst of all. Why? Now, I'm not saying this is the, the case always, but they might see in their parents, 
you know, everything fine, you know, in church, and they're cursing each other at home. That can result in kids just totally being turned off by anything that has to do with God. Amen. Now, again, don't, don't misquote me. I'm not saying that if a preacher has a kid that's gone, you know, south, that that's not always the preacher's fault. It's not always the parent's fault. Even God was a parent, and his, his first kids turned out bad, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, we have to think, though, that we don't want to live as hypocrites. In the old days, the hypocrites, the very word hypocrite meant an actor. Now, because mostly men were actors, you know, with the Greek you know, theaters, mostly men were actors, so they would have a mask. You guys are used to masks. We just came through Halloween. They would have a mask on a, a little uh, wooden stake or a pole. And then they would go backstage real quickly and then get another mask and hold that other mask up and come out as a different character. That was a hypocrite. A hypocrite was a person that changed faces. You know? We're one person, right? You're one person. I'm one person. So let's, with that grace of God, be one person. One person. All the time. James asks the question, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Where does water come from? Now, I know probably some kids would say the supermarket. <laughs> Just like some kids think that uh, their grandparents are ATM machines, right? But water comes from the earth and the springs in specific. And if you go to Israel today, and if you go to the, the people of Israel would have known very well of uh, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea wasn't too far away from Jerusalem. It was a large body of water, and it was called the Dead Sea because nothing lived in it. Nothing could live in it. The chemicals are so horrible. There's so much salt content. It's just, it's dead. And there are springs that are around the Dead Sea that spring up salt water. And if you're thirsty and you're dying of thirst, and you go and you drink those springs of salt water, then you just die more quickly. But you go a little bit north, where the Jordan River comes into the Dead Sea, and there are other springs there where they are fresh water. Now, here's a quiz. If you have good, fresh water, and you have bad salt water, and you mix them together, does the bad salt water uh, become good? Does it? Yes or no? No. So, the salt water doesn't have the effect on the good water by... Um, it has the effect on the good water by making it bad. But the fresh water connecting with the salt water doesn't make the salt water good, right? And so the mixing of the two always results in the bad overcoming. That's why when it comes to the words that we use, it's not a matter of, well, I'll use bad words sometimes and I'll use good sometimes else. No. It's saying, God, I want to continually use my words for good. Because fresh water and salt water do not mix. So I'd like to leave this thought with you. Is control the sparks. Every one of us are going to speak. I don't recommend that we just clam up, we say, oh, I'm so afraid, I'm not going to say anything. No. God wants us to use our mouth to speak. But we need to have our hearts cleansed, washed. Here is a beautiful prayer that I want to end with this prayer from the book of Psalms. And I want you to say with your words, say this prayer with me. Okay? Let's all together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Stand with me and say it again. Pray it to God, all right?
Are you ready? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalms 19.